Hi, and welcome to the video on SN2 reactions. You can find reading and get some extra information from Smith's Organic Chemistry textbook, or you can look up the SN2 section in any other organic textbook. The SN2 mechanism has an electrophile bearing a good leaving group that reacts with strong nucleophile. We will discuss what makes a good nucleophile in a few minutes. In this example, NU represents the nucleophile. The methyl bromide is the electrophile. An electrophile is electron deficient and receives electrons. We have the usual alpha carbon and a good leaving group, just like in the E1, SN1, and E2 reactions. In this case, the alpha carbon is methyl. It's not even primary because it doesn't have any other carbons bound to it. Let's look at the reaction mechanism. It's a substitution reaction using a nucleophile and there is a bimolecular rate determining step. The negatively charged nucleophile is attracted to the delta positive alpha carbon of the electrophile. As a bond forms between these two atoms, the leaving group leaves. Generally, it's a single step reaction. Sometimes there's an extra step for a deprotonation or protonation before or after the key step, although not in this case. We generate a substitution product. The reaction coordinate diagram is shown on screen. The starting materials are methyl bromide and acetate. As they react, a transition state structure is formed, which is higher energy than the starting materials or the products. As the reaction completes, the substitution product forms, which is more stable than the starting materials. The reaction has a certain activation energy and a certain delta H. The reaction is exothermic overall. There are a few key similarities and differences between the SN2 reaction and the others we have seen so far. There is a bimolecular rate determining step, like the E2 reaction. For the SN2 reaction, the rate depends on the concentration of the electrophile and of the nucleophile. The more crowded the alpha carbon, the more activation energy is required for the nucleophile to access it. The alpha carbon can be methyl, that's new, and it reacts faster than a primary alpha carbon and faster than secondary. Tertiary alpha carbons will not react in an SN2 mechanism. The leaving group has to be good, just like the other reaction. The nucleophile has to be strong. Remember that it was a weak nucleophile in the SN1 reaction. In E2 reactions, a strong base is required, and E1 reactions take place with weak bases. A polar aprotic solvent is best, just like with E2, although polar protic solvents can work. Protic solvents stabilize the nucleophile, making it less effective, which raises the activation energy of the reaction. In terms of regiochemistry, the location of the reaction, substitution occurs at the alpha carbon. There is no rearrangement because no carbocation forms. In terms of stereochemistry, an antiperiplanar arrangement of the nucleophile and leaving group is required to allow for the appropriate orbital alignment. That results in inversion of configuration of the stereogenic center. Contrast this result to the SN1 reaction, where both inversion and retention of stereochemistry occurred. Therefore, SN2 reactions give a single substitution product. The reaction is faster if the alpha carbon is methyl. That's faster than primary, faster than secondary, and tertiary doesn't work. For the reaction coordinate diagram on the left, there is a methyl alpha carbon and over on the right, there is a secondary alpha carbon. The transition state with the methyl alpha carbon is the least sterically hindered. Hydroxide can most easily approach that methyl group, and so we have a lower activation energy, and therefore a faster reaction. The transition state with the secondary alpha carbon and hydroxide as the nucleophile is more crowded, so it requires more energy for those two species to approach each other. The larger activation energy results in a slower reaction. The more hindered the alpha carbon, therefore, the slower the SN2 reaction. Next, we'll discuss the difference between bases and nucleophiles. When we talk about a base, we have been using the Bronsted definition of a base, or proton acceptor. Nucleophiles react with other electron deficient atoms, not protons. In general, a strong nucleophile is also a strong base. For example, here are two nucleophiles with the same nucleophilic atom. The amide, NH2- is the stronger base and the stronger nucleophile. The weaker base is resonance stabilized, make it, making it lower energy and a weaker base. It's also a weaker nucleophile. There are two important exceptions. The first case relates to steric hindrance. 
Sterically hindered nucleophiles require more energy to access the alpha carbon, resulting in a higher activation energy. In an example like terbutoxide compared to ethoxide, the very sterically hindered species is a weaker nucleophile than ethoxide, even though it's a stronger base, because it has three electron donating groups, which increases the charge on the oxygen. So steric hindrance makes for a weaker nucleophile, ethoxide is a stronger nucleophile, and a weaker base. The second case relates to the size of the nucleophilic atom. We compare the atoms bearing the negative charge. Sulfur is a larger atom than oxygen. Because it is larger, it can better spread out the electron density, lowering the energy of that anion and making it a weaker base. Oxygen is a stronger base. Nucleophilicity trends are opposite to this. The larger atom is more nucleophilic. The smaller atom is less nucleophilic. We will discuss this trend further when we analyze the molecular orbital picture of this reaction. Slide 13 has a summary of good nucleophiles for the SN2 reaction. Notice that there are quite a number of charged nucleophiles that are good. Anything generally with an O- is going to be a pretty good nucleophile. N- and even neutral amines are good nucleophiles. Carbon-based nucleophiles, carbon with a negative charge, and the halides, except for fluorides, work as nucleophile with iodide being the best halide. Sulfur is such a good nucleophile that it works in the SN2 reaction even when it is neutral. Here is an example that demonstrates the inversion of configuration that occurs in SN2 reactions. Here we have some nucleophile, abbreviated NU, the alpha carbon in the middle, and bromine, the good leaving group. The nucleophile reacts with that delta positive alpha carbon, and the bromine leaves. In the transition state, the bond to the nucleophile is forming, shown as a dotted line, and the bond to the leaving group is breaking, also shown as a dotted line. The nucleophile enters from the opposite side as the leaving group, although they are on the same plane. The nucleophile comes in anti-periplanar to the leaving group. This is very similar to what we saw in the E2 reaction. We'll see again that it's orbitals that control the reason for this arrangement. Just down below, the colors are showing you another way of looking at this. There's the blue nitrogen, or nucleophile, coming into the black alpha carbon. That black-red bond is breaking. The blue-black bond forming, the black-red bond breaking, and we have the product in which we see an inversion of configuration, a switching of the original configuration at that carbon center. In summary, in this video we analyzed the mechanism of the SN2 reactions and the requirements for an effective reaction. In particular, we analyzed the difference between an effective base and nucleophile for this reaction. In class, we are going to be digging deeper into differentiating between E1, SN1, E2, and SN2 reactions, and looking more closely at the molecular orbital picture of the mechanism to better understand the inversion of configuration of stereochemistry. To better understand the inversion of configuration at the alpha carbon.